so yeah, I didn't plan uh, that I would be following Victoria's talk about testing with something called Beyond Testing. Thanks to organizers. Woo! Sorry. That's cool. Um, you can follow me at Theo Jared on Twitter. I've been in the software business for about 20 years uh, in various roles. Spent the last eight and a half at Barracode doing application security stuff. Um, my bio says Grammy Award winner. Um, that's this. Uh, it's you know fun fact. I was on the recording that we got a Grammy for a couple years ago. It's an orchestral performance recording, and I was in the chorus. So you can draw your own conclusions from that. My bio also says Bacon Number of Three, which is uh, that's the soup Nazi for folks who don't know. But just to prove that I don't lie in my uh, in my confidence bios. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about culture clash, and uh, which I think is a topic that's close to most people's hearts at DevOps uh, conferences and in implementing DevOps. And I'm going to broaden it a little bit beyond the Dev and Ops part of the culture clash. Uh, we're going to talk after that a little bit about the uh, part that I'm dealing with in, in this world, which is application security, a little bit about why we think it's relevant, and then talk a little bit about, okay, so if you care about application security, how do you think about bringing it into what you're doing with DevOps? Um, this is the culture clash that most people think about when they think about DevOps, right? You know, it's the classic clash between I'm development, I need to get stuff delivered so that I can deliver value for my business, and the and the you know the job of production, which is historically been to keep things stable and safe. We've all solved that, right? And and you know everybody's really happy about how that's going, so we can all go home. Um, I, in reality, any culture clash and working that out is a work in progress, right? What I'm here to say is that from where we sit in security, there's an equally big culture clash between the culture of DevOps, which is, you know, we're happy rainbow land and we're, you know, deploying in minutes and everything's wonderful, and the culture of security, which says, really? You're going to send that out to production without checking to make sure that somebody could hack into it? Really? You know, and, and this is the reaction that a lot of people in security have to the whole DevOps mindset, even now in 2016. Um, a lot of people have probably seen this. <laughs> Raise your hands if you've seen that before, because it is a DevOps Day slide that I stole from somebody's presentation, right? This is how a lot of people in security think about DevOps. It's like, oh, it's wonderful rainbows and unicorns, but in reality, there's a you know, there's there's a hidden cost to moving fast without considering what the security is, and a lot of people in security. Myself included, frankly, and I'm going to own this one, are a little bit snarky about it, right? And and you know, but the the, the point is that security is like anything else, like infrastructure failures and and configuration issues, like you know, issues with other parts of your application. If you don't own making sure that you're solid as part of your overall end-to-end -end process, you're just pushing that cost downstream into production where it can be really big and hit you later. I love that you brought up the OpenSSL example which is a, you know, a great and ongoing story. We first heard about that with Heartbleed a couple of years ago. Take the pain of something like a Heartbleed, which in a lot of times is a component that's resident, you know, in a component that's resident on your server library, and then to take it into something that's actually inside the application. Um, back in November, somebody uh, published an exploit for Java deserialization vulnerabilities. Basically, you're gonna send uh, uh, a, uh, a Java object over the wire that can get deserialized in such a way that it can cause the, the host application, the host JVM, to run malicious code on your behalf. And you know, a lot of Java applications are designed to take Java objects over the wire. And it affected everything. It affected like um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the actual um, web application servers like Tomcat and JBoss. It affected Jenkins. It affected by our numbers, it affected about 25% of all Java applications in existence for one vulnerable version of the, of the, uh, the Java library that was affected alone, right? So that's just open source vulnerabilities. Forget about, you know, your developer has coded something that, uh, that, that breaks the world in its own special and unique special snowflake way. So if you're not in a place that cares about security for security's sake, and, and most organizations aren't, I would argue that your motivation needs to be thinking about this as quality. A lot of organizations care about the quality of the application that they deliver in terms of its being able to deliver value to customers in the way that it's anticipated to, uh, to do, right, and it, that it's advertised to do. Security, at its simplest level, can be thought of as a way of taking quality from the perspective of the availability of the application, 
the integrity of the information that application provides or the confidentiality of that information, and just ensuring that that is, you know, is, is, uh, is, is you know, protected, is, is, uh, is, is kept whole, right? So if you, if you need a motivation on how to think about security in, in, in DevOps terms, this is not a bad one, and it's one that's probably more portable than most ways people talk about security. If you want to talk about the pain of not having security, um, this is as good an illustration as I've been able to find. Um, information is beautiful, uh, has a fantastic visualization of data breach activity. Size of bubble is number of records leaked. Color of bubble is what caused the breach ultimately to occur. And you can go to information is beautiful, I think it's .com, uh, but if you look up information is beautiful, uh, data breach visualization, you'll get this. And so what I did was take a look at you know, the breach activity up to you know, September, whatever, when I grabbed this. And then I turned off all the bubbles that weren't caused by something, that, that were caused by something like uh, configuration failure, which could lead to a security problem, that were caused by hacking, um, or were caused by some other information security related cause, right? And I think the, the practical point is that if you care about your customers' you know, data safety, then security should be somewhere on your priority list. Let's motivate this into applications specifically, because a lot of people don't necessarily make this connection. You spend a lot of time wondering, you know, are we being hacked by China or Russia or script kiddies or whatever else? Attribution is, is kind of a pointless exercise because a lot of it ultimately boils down to code. It's an error in the code that allows an attacker in. And they're more widespread than you think. This is data that's coming from our forthcoming state of software security report, which is an annual report we do every year. In the applications that we tested, we see 35% of them having some sort of hard-coded credential. We see 32% of them having some sort of SQL injection vulnerability that will allow an attacker with the appropriate string to go in and steal data. Open redirects, uh, site scripting, it goes on and on and on. Uh, something like seven out of ten applications that we test the first time that we see them have one of the top ten most prevalent web application vulnerabilities in them the first time that we see them. And that's a number that's stayed relatively constant over the last eight years. So it's a pervasive problem. So, okay, security's a problem. There's a culture clash between uh, you know, the desire to make things secure and the desire to ship things quickly. Wouldn't it be great if we could get into alignment around making those things happen together? I'm going to, I think actually I can skip this last point. I think we've made the point, but the, la the last thing is, you know, if you're in a company that cares about or manages credit card information, if you have a customer that cares about security, if you have a desire to not put your customers through the windshield when you're, you know, deploying software very quickly, then you actually want to avoid this scenario of, being stopped at the last minute because you care about security and you find out that your application is you know, insecure and you can't deploy, right? So our motivation for taking application security and making it part of the DevOps happy family of, uh, of you know, um, functions that, that work together is to pull that you know, Batman bitch slap moment um, back further into the development process and make it less painful by catching the security problems closer to when they're introduced so that you do not get into a scenario where you are making a choice between shipping late or not shipping at all, or shipping something that you know is vulnerable. Okay. So let's cooperate is the point. Um, we've been talking to customers about securing fast moving development cycles for a long time under various names. Um, the cycles get faster, the names get uh, different. Recently, you know, DevOps is, is what customers are talking to us about in enterprises and small, uh, uh, small software development shops and other places. Uh, and what we've started to come to is, is a, a set of principles that we're kind of coalescing around. And that's what I want to spend uh, basically the rest of the talk talking about, is how do you do this? Um, and these five principles are, are pretty common sense, but there are some nuances in them that we'll explore that maybe aren't obvious if you don't spend a lot of your time obsessing about application security. Um, and that's what I'm going to try to bring a little bit of flavor up for you today. Um, automation, integration, avoiding false alarms, security championship, and operational visibility. The idea with this is um, I think that one of the things that we make as a uh, fundamental error 
when we're looking at DevOps as non-DevOps practitioners and trying to figure out how we play, is we spend all of our time thinking about CI/CD pipelines, which is fine and it's important and it's necessary, but I don't think it's the whole story for how you securely practice delivering software at speed. I think that you have to think about what happens before the pipeline and how you change the culture of the people who are developing software and how it's developed. And I think you have to think about what happens after the pipeline in production. So let me take you through that. So when we're talking about automated security testing, um, I think this is the part that is maybe the most obvious. Uh, it's congruent with what all other sorts of testing that go to DevOps end up doing, right? We just spent a lot of time talking about automated testing to make sure that your infrastructure is what you think it should be, right? There's automated unit testing. There's other types of automated testing that gets run. In the security world, what you're talking about is um, for applications, as distinct from testing for, for vulnerabilities in the, uh, in the infrastructure layer, you're talking about one of a couple of automated technologies. You're talking about static application security testing. Basically, you're taking either the source code or in the case of what my company does, the, the compiled code of the application, creating a model of it, looking for conditions in that model that would indicate that a security flaw could happen, and then tracing back and making sure that an attacker could actually get to that point in code, because there's no point in flagging on something that's dead code, right? So static uh, uh, automated security testing covers the whole application, runs quickly, generally speaking, um, and, and gives you a view of what's going on and what the developer actually wrote. There's dynamic application security testing running against web applications or with some flavors of it against mobile applications, looking at the application at runtime. It has the ability of being able to look for things in the infrastructure as well as the application as it's configured. And there's also software composition analysis, which is um, I, it's one of those technologies that kind of crosses over into what people in DevOps are already doing, but it's, it's basically concerned with if you're building an application using code that you've gotten from other people as assemblies, Ruby gems, uh, DLLs in the, in the Microsoft world, uh, jar files and other you know, frameworks, uh, other packages in the Java world, your likely uh, path to getting that, uh, that third party library in was your developer found it, uh, or you found it, you decided that it met your needs, you brought it into your application and then you forgot about it, and then you probably upgraded it the next time you needed something <coughs> functionally useful in the next version of that library. The problem with that approach turns out to be that software uh, it does not age like fine wine. It, it ages, uh, from a security perspective, a little bit closer to something like milk. Um, and the longer that the software is sitting around, the more likely that nasty actors are going to come in and, uh, and find something uh, to exploit in it. I'm going to credit Josh Corman of Sony Type, formerly of Sony Type, with that analogy, by the way, not mine. Um, so with, with software composition analysis, you're just getting a bill of materials of the third-party components in the application and figuring out what is that application vulnerable to today. And then you keep the bill of materials in case tomorrow there's a new vulnerability in OpenSSL so that you can figure out that you've got uh, a problem in that application when you want to fix it. So at least three ways of doing automated security testing. There's others that are out there, but we'll stop there. Um, the other point about automation is you want to be able to actually automate the testing. It's no good being automated if you're requiring a person with a tool to sit down, configure the tool, tweak it, and run it by hand, which was version one of application security starting in about 2000 to about 2006, right? You need APIs, you need to be able to script it, you need to be able to run it from your pipeline, um, and, and so the good news is that there's a lot of options that you can take to do that. So that's automation of security in. The second point is failing early in the process. And there's a couple of pieces that are important to think about for this. One is there's a lot of choices about where you put security testing in a development process. Um, there's, we talked with customers who want to do some level of security testing as a, uh, a check on applications after they've passed all the other functional tests, um, which is not a bad way to, uh, to think about it. There's others who want to bring it up further as a, like a pre-commit test for very serious issues. We think that there's other you know, things you can think about as well, like giving security testing tools to developers that are actually in their IDEs so that you can test while the code is being written. Bring it closer to the point of failure so that you can figure out that you've got a security problem as early as you possibly can is the, is the general principle here. Um, and then uh, the, the third problem uh, that you run into with security tools in particular um, is 
what we call the false positive problem. Um, security tools are written for security people, by and large, and the mentality with which most security tools are designed is it's much more important to make sure that we find out everything that could possibly be wrong with this application than it is to worry about whether we're going to have a few findings that aren't actually quite correct, right? And the algorithms that you're writing to figure out if there's a security vulnerability there uh, have to do things like consider data flow across applications with hundreds of millions of, uh, of control points that are you know, mapped into memory in one big in-memory model, so they have to follow this enormous graph. They have to you know, perform, you know, compute tasks that don't actually complete, but they have to complete, right? So, um, so there's trade-offs that are getting made between having the tests complete in time and having them not return a lot of noise. And generation one tools generally you know, err on the side of including everything, making sure that you find everything, and then they have really high false positive rates. That's okay if you've got a security professional running the tool. It's less good if you're plugging the tool into your CI/CD pipeline. Um, best outcome in that case is you're taking the output from the tool and you're pushing it out of the pipeline into something like a defect tracking system and going back and dealing with it later. Worst output is that you start stopping the pipeline for things that don't turn out to be really security issues, and then after you do that five or six times, you turn the tool off, right? And then you're back to where you started. So we think there are two things that you want to consider here uh, in how you do security testing in the pipeline. One is start with something that has a lower false positive rate to begin with. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer, but people don't actually necessarily think about it when they're, when they're looking at this problem. And the other is if you actually do have a uh, false positive you know, problem, you need to find a way to tell the tool that in this application that's a false positive and then have it remember the next time it scans the application. So, not rocket science, but it is something that we run into when we talk to customers about this. I want to talk about something other than the pipeline for a second, because this is kind of the hobby horse that I get on about, uh, about DevOps. I think that it's very easy to make um, you know, shipping software quickly just a technology problem, but I don't think it is, and I don't think that a lot of people in this room believe it is anyway. I kind of have to go through this spiel for folks who are in you know, corporate uh, development shops and stuff because they haven't necessarily gone through that same thought journey. If what you're trying to do with DevOps is shorten feedback cycles, take lessons that you're learning in the process of building software and bring them earlier to the process so you don't repeat the same mistakes over and over again, you cannot ignore what is actually happening in the development of the software, how the software is actually being built, and how you know, security issues are getting in in the first place. And I'm here to tell you that there's not a developer that I know who deliberately creates security issues or creates security issues because they're dumb because developers aren't dumb, right? You know, the issue, generally speaking, is number one, either you didn't know that you know, a particular attack category was possible, number two, you didn't know how to defend against a particular attack category, or number three, you were going so fast that you made a mistake, right? It's like anything else. So we can't do a lot about number three except to test and catch those mistakes and tell you about them when they happen. What we can do about number one and two is to get developers a little bit of coaching and education so that they learn uh, about what secure coding principles are, about what types of attacks are that are out there, and so that they have that knowledge when they're sitting down and writing software. And we can do some other things as well, like baking security into the way that software is being built from a process perspective. And I don't mean capital P process, I mean things like, you know, hey, once I've got a security educated person on the team, I might actually have a task for a story that's part of the definition of done for that story that says, we're going to have a security review of the design before the feature gets coded. And then we're going to you know, go back and, and maybe do a security code review if we want to do that, or else we're just going to let the tools catch it. But one way or the other, getting security into the definition of done, if you're doing agile stories, is, is not a bad way to think about this from a cultural perspective. When it comes to the training side of it, um, there's lots of different options you can choose from here. All of them do something. Um, Computer-based training is a scalable way to get you know, introduction to basic concepts. It moves the needle a little bit, um, and I think it's important. I also don't think it's, it's enough. We see from our data that organizations that do computer-based training on secure development principles have about a 30% higher vulnerability fix rate than those that don't, which is good. It's a good start. What actually turns out to really move the needle is teaching developers about secure coding principles and remediation strategies 
in their own application when there's a security finding that they don't understand how to fix. We call that remediation coaching. We measured the effect of that, and it turns out that your fixed rate for vulnerabilities when you go through a coaching session with somebody who's actually done this before is more like 150 times, 150% uh, more vulnerabilities being fixed, so it's not quite, uh, help me do the math. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than, than double the vulnerabilities that you would fix without the benefit of that, of that sort of capability. So, the, the big takeaway that I take from this is that there are a couple of different ways that you can take knowledge about application security, get it to your development teams, bake it into how they're making software, bake it into the skill set that they're already bringing to the table, and it actually has an effect on how quickly vulnerabilities get addressed, how many vulnerabilities get addressed, and over time, we think, and this is the part that is harder to measure, reduces the number of vulnerabilities that get introduced in the first place, which is what you're trying to do with these feedback cycles in DevOps. The last piece of this you know, puzzle is the ops side of things. And this is the part that you know, gets up my nose the most when I hear people talking about security and DevOps, and they're only talking about the pipeline. I'm like, oh good, we've made sure that what we're you know, shipping is as tested as, we can, as it can be before we push it into production, or before we have a release candidate that will later push into production. So we're not going to do anything about it in production, which seems kind of odd, right? So from, from a couple of different perspectives, I think that there are some things that you want to think about in production with applications uh, from a security perspective as well. The first thing that we think about is, number one, what happens if there is an attack, right? A, I want to know. <laughs> you know, I want to know that that's happened. I want it being logged. I want it, you know, showing up in bright blinking letters on my dashboard, and I want visibility into it so that I can take that feedback and act quickly on it, first in an incident response way, second in doing root cause analysis with the team and figuring out why did that attack succeed or why did that attack happen in the first place and what can we do about it, right? The other thing I'd really like is if the attack was attempted and failed because we had some sort of protective technology in place. In the security industry, there have been two approaches uh, that have been tried for this. One is network layer web application firewalls. Anybody use a web application firewall in what you do? You like them? I don't have anything against them. I think they're great for DDoS. I think the operational problem with web application firewalls has been to get them to actually protect against application layer attacks. You have to know where the vulnerability points are in your application. You have to know what you know, URLs, what form fields, et cetera, that you're looking for because the, the, the raw pattern matching that WASP do without any sort of training your rules on them is not enough to block these attacks. And the problem is that you then have to maintain the rule set along with everything else you're doing when you shift the application. So if I'm doing code to protect a vulnerable point in my application as part of my development process, why didn't I just like do code to fix the vulnerability in the first place? So WASs are still useful. Um, they're actually a compliance control for things like PCI. I'm not saying don't do them. I'm saying you know be aware of what they can and can't do and what you have to do to make them successful. The other technology which is emergent is something called runtime application security protection. This is the concept here, and there's a couple of different ways that this gets implemented in the industry, is you have an agent that lives inside the runtime of the application. If you use New Relic, something like that, it's, you know, in, in the Java world, it's an instrumentation agent that sits on top of the Java instrumentation API and can access the inside runnings of the application. It can look at places that are vulnerable. It can see you know, execution paths that touch those. And if it realizes that something is an attack, and it does have to have enough intelligence to recognize an attack, it can actually rewrite the execution of what's about to happen so that the attack gets neutralized, as well as you know, logging out to the, uh, the server. So cool technology, um, very early stages, um, something to keep an eye on and be aware that it's out there. The last thing on the operational side that I want to talk about is just you know, something that your security team can still do, you know, even if they're a separate organization, is execute you know, tests of the entire perimeter to make sure that there aren't any applications popping up that they didn't know about, that aren't going through your DevOps team's processes, that aren't you know, going through all these controls that we've already talked about, and then just make sure that they understand the vulnerability state of those. So that's you know, a, a different thing that you can think of from an operational perspective. So when I, want, when I go and talk to you know, insurance companies, banks, aircraft, craft manufacturers, ISVs, whatever, 
about how they're taking steps into DevOps and what their brave new world is. And they ask me, okay, so where should we put the testing tools? I say, I, I think it's a slightly bigger problem than that. I think that if, you, if you're thinking about how to secure DevOps, yes, you want to do testing of the application as part of your integrated pipeline, but you also want to think about what's actually happening in the development side of it and think about how do you take feedback about application security and make your developers better. And I think you want to think about it on the operational side as well and look at what's happening when the application's running and under attack. And I think that if you broaden the aperture of how you think about security with applications and you know, take in mind some of these things that, that are possible to do now that go way, way beyond testing, I think you actually start to have a fighting chance at keeping applications safe against attackers. And that's something that I think we'd all be happy to do. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank <laughs> you.